So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers to talk about uh, the knowledge economy and how we can take advantage of it. So first, um, Simon Smith, uh, who we're very fortunate to have here. Um, uh, he's, he's the Secretary of, uh, of the uh, Department of Energy, uh, Industry. Sorry. Uh, his previous positions were Chief Executive to the Office of Finance and Services and Deputy Secretary to the New South Wales Department of Premier and Cabinet. Um, he, he's a very senior person in the, in the New South Wales bureaucracy, but uh, for us, just as, as important, uh, he's someone that's passionate about the environment and, and really gets what we're trying to do, uh, which is a rare thing in this, uh, in this day and age. Um, and um, I think you know, he, he definitely gets what needs to be done in terms of uh, gaining the level of understanding that we need to take advantage of the opportunities coming up in this, in this area. So with that, over to Simon. Thanks very much, everyone. And I'm keenly aware that it's the end of the day and I stand between you and the drinks, I guess. Are there drinks? Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> good, good to hope so. Um, so firstly, I just wanted to congratulate everyone who's here and the organisers for putting on this summer school. I think it's uh, a great thing that, that you've done and, and I know um, that it's a lot of hard work, so well done. And I also wanted just to acknowledge a lot of the people in the room who I know who've put so much work into what used to be the energy efficiency agenda but now more broadly defined as energy productivity because I know it's an area that has always struggles to get uh, the recognition of, the, of its value compared to the competing options for deployment of capital and meeting customer needs and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I guess it's quite similar to a lot of reform stories where beneficiaries are diffused and numerous and those who stand to lose are, are small and stand to lose, stand to lose a lot, uh, which always makes for really hard work. So, you know, sort of keep it, keep it up. Congratulations. Um, I've mainly come uh, this afternoon just to be here to answer questions and participate so that you know that the government is interested in this in this topic and to sort of signal, make some sort of directional comments about level of interest from government in the future. But I don't hold myself out as an expert in this sphere. I used to work in it some time ago. I haven't been involved in the last couple of years. So, you know, you can correct me if I'm out of date. Um, but when I was really deeply involved in this, the time the, at the time, the debate was about uh, the government was running, and the former government was running an inquiry uh, which was based on the premise that if we didn't have another coal-fired power plant by today, the lights would be off by today. Yeah. So I just, and at that time, I remember the the defenders of orthodoxy were adamant that, you know, our ideas that energy efficiency could offset that need were thought we were insane. Yeah. So it, it is it is interesting, you know. I'm looking around the room and I can see a few fellow uh, fellow travellers who were, you know, were there and, and remember how much things have changed since then, but still how much potential there is ahead. Um, I remember at the time having lots of arguments to say, well, how can there be a role for government on energy efficiency? We don't see $100 notes lying on the floor, on the, on the, on the sidewalk. I remember talking with, um, you know, having lots of arguments about uh, the extent to which this issue could be defined by the term market failure and whether there was any of it around here, you know, mostly saying nothing to see here, keep moving along, <laughs> there is no such thing. Um, but, you know, having very passionate debates about how regulatory systems, for example, you know, regul regulation doesn't come out of nowhere, it gets invented because there is a real problem that needs to be fixed. Um, what the problem with it is, is that over time, uh, the regulator sort of shapes itself to the incumbent models of whatever the activity is that's being regulated. A bit like, um, what's the name of that leather suit of armour that Roman legions used to wear? Is it a greave? You know how they have the, the sort of thing that goes and shows their six pack and it's all, all leather? Like the, the regulation becomes like that. It perfectly follows the shape of, of the incumbency and eventually solidifies and becomes more like a suit of armour that prevents any kind of change whatsoever. Um, the, you know, the, and many arguments about the clear information asymmetries that operate in, in energy markets. You know, just the fact that... And, and, and the disbursement of benefits, how... Um, you know, why would a citizen individually want to try to figure out all these issues out and, and optimise, you know, like they've, got, they don't have, they've got limited time, they can't think about all this detail, they just want someone to make it easy and at the time the model was, well then tell them to plug it in and pay, you know, that was the, that was the thinking at the time. So all those arguments still, will still inevitably happen but I think considerable progress uh, has been made as, you know, largely a result of people in the room and your colleagues. 
And I don't think it's good to be too black either about what already has been achieved in New South Wales. I think there is some very impressive things that have been done over the years. I mean, I think of the energy savings scheme as a very strong initiative that was led from New South Wales. Uh, I think, um, although maybe it's not going fast enough, I think uh, the approach on a voluntary rollout of smart meters is better than nothing and has avoided some of the dramas that, have, that, that other jurisdictions sort of setbacks that they've uh, experienced. And it's quite heartening now finally to see some of the renewable energy um, uncertainty having been resolved in Canberra that there's more interest now in investing and in fact we do have very large um, solar plants and there are quite a lot more that are in the pipeline to get funded with increasing demand in the months ahead which is all very exciting. We also had a very generous solar bonus scheme so there is a tremendous number of people who have now correct, connected in a practical way with, with renewable energy generation on their roof. But I think um, that's all good, but now we need to think about what's going to happen next. And the topic I've been asked to speak about is the, is the knowledge economy, which sort of brings me to say, well, okay, how are we going to pitch this idea that we have about energy productivity to the broader community and, and also to the political leaders who make decisions? I think the key is to, in my view, is to look to see what the government's stated number one priority is, which is jobs. And jobs, the government's chosen jobs to be its number one priority for the obvious reasons. and you know, which is that it helps people pay the bills uh, and it also is a great way to develop human potential. You know, we all know if you've got a job, you get a lot more out of it than the paycheck. You know, you grow as a human being in all the skills and interactions that you acquire. Secondly, it's a, it's a great way to create a coherent society because it creates a structure through which people can interact with strangers to achieve beneficial outcomes. So people get on with each other, it normalises human s society and it has the final benefit, of course, if you've got a lot of people who don't have a job, they can't afford to look after themselves, and in our society, some, that means someone else has got to pay to look after them, which just means that all the people who do have a job have to pay for that. So it's clearly a lot better if there are more people with a job, each experiencing less cost to look after those who don't have one. So that's why jobs are number one. Now, the government set up a new body called Jobs for New South Wales because it wants to sort of cut through investment and, uh, and activity on how jobs will be created. And there's a couple of very interesting early pieces of work coming out of that which are relevant here. One is we've done some work which looked at all firms who employ people in New South Wales and divided them, you know, sliced and diced in many ways to try to determine patterns. The most interesting, compelling pattern that I've seen is that if you, if you divide firms into large, medium and small, if you look at over the last, say, eight years, what's happened with large firms, they employ far less people than they used to eight years ago in aggregate. And that's mainly because large firms become established and they move into the stage of substituting capital and outsourcing for labour, and so they need fewer people. If you look at the vast majority of the small and medium-sized enterprises, they've done nothing. Most of them don't grow, they just sit there. Um, some of them die, but they seem to be replaced by other firms of equal size. So there's just this tiny fraction of about 3% of all small and medium-sized firms who account for all net jobs growth. And that holds true across every, almost every sector of the economy. So, this, so if you're interested in jobs, you've got to think, okay, well, how do we get more, of, more companies like that and stop trying to help all the firms that don't want to grow or that are going to shed labour because of their, their industry dynamics? And so we call those firms gazelles. And what we find is that while Australia is above average in formation of new firms, it's way below its internationally comparable jurisdictions in the proportion of new firms which go on to grow rapidly. So there's something about our entrepreneurial culture that is weak. And I actually think that that is a very good window. It's a good way into talking about the possibilities that you've been discussing over the last three days, which is how can the government work with disruptive technologies and those entrepreneurs who want to grow rapidly? To me, that is the most appealing way to connect with the government's number one uh, priority. Um, in also, in, in doing that work, we've been looking to say, well, okay, where are the jobs going to come from? So there's a lot of jobs that will come anyway. So as the population grows and, and as it ages, the demand for certain types of jobs increases. So, you know, you get more people, that means you need more schools and teachers. As you get more old people, you need more social services and care and health services, etc. So we're not going to focus on any of that because we think that'll just happen anyway. So what we are going to focus on is those segments of the economy where we could do really well or we might not do so well. And I think... Uh, you know, some of those are sectors that are that are seek to grow by attaching, you know, hanging on to the growth of Asia's middle class. Because if we just maintain market share, that's growing so large. You know, a, a, an equal share of a larger pie equals a lot of jobs here for us. Those sort of firms will depend on our 
our secure, like our safe, clean and green uh, offering. So when we can offer, you know, safe, safe education and quality education, or safe food products, or safe pharmaceuticals, etc. We know we're doing well in those, and we could do really well more. But the second big agenda, I think, really is in the area of smart cities and infrastructure. So that's another way in for this uh, energy productivity agenda to, to thrive, because. You know, well, you know, you know, I don't need to convince you. You've spent three days convincing yourselves that um, this immense opportunity exists to get more from the same or more from less in terms of energy productivity, and it all comes down to technology and th the frameworks that allow it to thrive. So that's the second way that I think that we can connect with the government's uh, priorities. So my sort of final uh, comment or near to final is I actually think reflecting on the last 10 years of the people who are in this room and the people who go to the, the mainstream energy conferences, so like the energy conferences arranged by the electricity distributors and networks and so forth, I think it's quite odd that we're still having different rooms. Mm -hmm. I think across the government we've got sort of energy efficiency over here, we've got, even in my own department, we've got renewable energy over there and we've got sort of fossil fuel energy over here and then we've got a whole bunch of people in Canberra who are making all the, or Sydney, Canberra sort of Commonwealth institutions that are making decisions on the markets. I think we've got, you know, tribes of academics who are kind of the old the engineering grid guys, and we've got the, you know, in the the renewables and the and the uh, sustainable futures academics in different tribes as well. And I think, um, I think it's sort of time for the tribes to come together, and I'd like to be a part of trying to let that happen. Um, and I think what may bring us together is some of the very big technological changes that are going to come no matter what. So I'm thinking particularly storage and what's going to happen with the grid and the pricing of the grid, how's that all going to work out? I'm thinking electric vehicles as a, as a very large source of energy demand, which if done well could be very favourable, if done poorly could be very unfavourable in terms of the way our energy systems work. Um, and I'm thinking about the intersection of energy with uh, climate mitigation policies, how that's all going to play out. Um, you know, we're in such an interesting time you know, my, our own department in the resources and energy area has been preoccupied with everything to do with gas and coal over the last two years because of the very challenging uh, market conditions and the very challenging uh, situation the industry finds itself in with its communities in local issues. So, to be truthful, that sort of sucks a fair bit of oxygen out of our capability to deal with these other matters in recent years. But the good news is that uh, the Premier and Minister Roberts have signalled repeatedly to us they want us to work towards an advanced energy agenda. They see the jobs in it, they see the technology, they see the opportunities. Uh, so that's the very, very positive news that I wanted to conclude with, is that um, we, we have to recognise that, you know, we see, you know, we in this room see these energy issues as mainly from the energy using an energy efficiency and productivity perspective. That's not necessarily how other people who we need to align with will see it. So that's why I've made these suggestions about how we connect. Uh, with those agendas. So uh, I'll leave it at that and answer any questions when panel time comes. Thank you.